to tell you about this unspoiled island, this sunny paradise with miles and miles of beautiful sandy beaches, gentle surf warm enough to swim in all year round, sand dunes that look like mammoth mounds of sugar, lush vegetation teeming with spectacular birds and animals, and surprisingly practically no people. An enchanting island tucked away in the South Pacific? No, it's right here in the United States in our own waters off the coast of Florida. It's called St. George Island. Now, in recent years, we've all heard of the construction boom in Florida with hotels, condominiums, and high-rises competing for every foot of beachfront property. St. George has been spared simply because people don't know it exists. Here, let me show you exactly where we are. Now, there's New York. Here's the heavily traveled East Coast. And then there's Miami down there. St. Petersburg, west coast of Florida, and right here is St. George Island, off the coast of Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, the island is well off the proverbial beaten path, not forgotten, just undiscovered. We're now going to explore this island, and I'll introduce you to some of the people who live around here. I'll tell you about their way of life and why they want to keep it that way. To get here from New York, I first flew to Tallahassee, the capital of Florida. At the Tallahassee airport, I was introduced to Professor William Rogers of Florida State University. He is an expert on St. George Island and the surrounding area. Mr. Fair, you see this is St. George's Island. It's a barrier island protecting the city of Apalachicola at the mouth of the Apalachicola River. Mm -hmm. Between Apalachicola and the island is Apalachicola Bay and beyond that the Gulf. Not very much is known about this island, even by Floridians, let alone the rest of the people in the United States. It may well have been discovered in 1513 by Ponce de Leon, who also, of course, discovered Florida. And in that same expedition, according to legend, he may have come around the coast of Florida over to Pensacola. If he did that, then he was the first European to see St. George's Island. Very, very interesting. It was in 1519 when Francisco de Garay mapped for Spain from Florida over to Texas, and he, uh, without question, saw it. Then, probably in 1528, well, undoubtedly then, Cabeza de Vaca uh, and Narvaez and their ill-fated expedition uh, trying to reach Mexico from Florida, seeking refuge from the Indians, came by here. I'd love to know more about this. Almost no people know about this island. Not anyone lived on it uh, for 
centuries and only in, only in the last 15 or 20 years and only with the bridge being built across from the mainland in 1965 have people begun to, to live on the island and, and enjoy it. Yes, I can see. This is like a barrier island here. And there's a bridge from here to here now, huh? That's fascinating. Yes, it is. And equally fascinating is how little is known about the island. There's not much uh, that's been written about it or printed about it. I, I'm, in my writing on it, I've done research in Washington at the Library of Congress and the National Archives. and gotten material from England and from Spain, uh, as well as from Apalachicola and the courthouse at Franklin County. So in order to find out about a small island off the coast of Florida, you have to go to England and to Spain for your sources. A great deal of it is in European archives because, of course, St. George's Island was owned by Spain, also owned by England, contended for by France, owned by Florida, by the United States, by the Indians, of course. From Tallahassee to St. George Island is a little over an hour of comfortable driving. It's an interesting trip with a startling richness and variety to the passing landscape. The closer you get to St. George Island, the more boats and seafood industry you see. By the time you reach Carabelle, you might give in and stop for a dozen oysters on the half shell, probably plucked from the waters of the bay only hours earlier. And then you see it, with its two graceful arcs and a gentle S-shaped curve, the bridge joining St. George Island to the mainland. On the island, I sometimes feel like a modern-day Robinson Crusoe, and frankly, I like it, especially after the hectic pace of city and urban living. The air is refreshingly clean here. There's no unpleasant noise, just the gentle murmur of the ocean surf and the soft rustle of an ever-present breeze. Very few people here to disturb your peace. You can venture out, catch your own dinner. Your life can revert to basics and very few places are left in the world today where that is still possible. Seashells, thousands of seashells. Some are truly magnificent, like these collector's items. People also come to gather ancient bottles spewed up by the ocean surf. Many are imbued with a romantic past. This particular one is said to have come from Her Majesty's ship Fox, whose captain, so the story goes, buried a fabulous treasure here. Incidentally, it is yet to be found. Traditionally, the island has served as a haven for shipwrecked sailors, adventurers, and others of similar inclination. The lighthouse in St. George Island was built almost 100 years ago. It's still in use, and things haven't changed much in all that time. For instance, back in 1849, the lighthouse keeper was having trouble making ends meet on his annual salary of $450. So, he had his lawyer pen the following letter to the Secretary of the Treasury. Sir, I have been solicited by Francis Lee, keeper of the lighthouse at Cape St. George, to ask that his salary be raised to the same sum as the keeper of the lights at Dog Island and Cape St. Blas, both in this district, to wit, $500. The present site is much more difficult of access and cannot be approached in a boat within two miles. He cannot land or keep his boat in consequence of the surf. He is obliged to land and moor his boat on the inside of the bay and transport all his provisions across the island to the seaside. His light is as large as either of the others and requires as much attention and labor. I am, sir, respectfully, your obedient servant, Samuel W. Spencer. And that's where you do your oystering. That's the bay over there. As long ago as 1784, America's first geographer, Thomas Hutchins, predicted that one day the bay would support a great fishing industry. Now, if you look across the bay on a clear day, you'll see the center of that fishing industry, Apalachicola. Oysters, along with shrimp and scallops, are the backbone of Apalachicola's economy. More than half of the entire workforce are directly dependent on the fishing industry. Commercial fishing here first started about a hundred years ago, and for many of these people, it's a way of life going back three or four generations. Down. 
colorful extravaganza, the Florida Seafood Festival. John Meyer is executive director of the festival. The festival really reflects our way of life. Once a year, we 3,000 literally ask the world to come and visit for a day. And for that one day, we entertain 30 to 40,000 guests. was founded in the 1820s by a group of wealthy stockholders who came here from New York and Connecticut. That waterfront was once the third largest cotton port in the United States. Hundreds of ships of all kinds put into Apalachicola. Side wheelers, stern wheelers, sailing vessels from New York and many European countries. Behind me is one of the original warehouses that lined the waterfront. The cotton was shipped here by barge from Alabama and Georgia and then picked up by ocean-going vessels. Apalachicola became a boom town. They had five banks here in the 1830s with reputedly as much money as the rest of Florida combined. Because of the shipping, Apalachicola had a very international atmosphere. In the streets and waterfront saloons, you could hear French, Spanish, Italian, and other languages being spoken. Directly across from the church is a memorial to John Gorey, the Apalachicola physician who invented refrigeration in the middle of the last century. He had come to Apalachicola in the 1840s to help fight yellow fever. He developed his refrigeration machine while experimenting with ways of keeping his patients cool and comfortable. His invention was met with considerable skepticism. After all, everybody knew that the only way to get ice was to bring it in by barge from the Great Lakes and store it in sawdust until it was melted. In this connection, there's an interesting story that people around here like to tell about John Gorey. It was Bastille Day. That's the French 4th of July. And the French consul to Apalachicola wanted to celebrate with a bottle of champagne. But being July, there was no ice in Apalachicola. So Dr. John Gorey offered to help. Well, the word spread like wildfire. Everybody was wondering how Dr. Gorey was going to come up with ice in July. <laughs> well, they had a big celebration. And the whole town turned out to see how Gorey would pull off this trick. They had an orchestra, real big time. And just when everybody was beginning to think the champagne had wasn't going to appear, the big doors opened up and out came servants carrying huge baskets of ice surrounding bottles and bottles of champagne. <laughs> well, everybody applauded like mad and they raised their glasses to toast the French consul and he must have thought it was a, some kind of miracle. <laughs> My great-grandfather moved to Apalachicola in the 1820s. And like most people who live here, we love Apalachicola and all that it represents. Our history, our way of life here. And yet, of course, too, we'd love to bring some additional economic benefits to the area. I see it as sort of a challenge and an opportunity to, the challenge to preserve our history, our way of life, to keep the best that we have. And yet the opportunity to capitalize on some of the natural recreation and other tourism benefits that could come here. I think that that's our challenge, to keep the best of both worlds for us here. Commercial fishing here first started about 100 years ago, and for many of these people, it's a way of life, going back three or four generations. They're a conservative lot, eager to protect their way of life. They still use many of the methods of a hundred years ago, like these tongs, for fear they might upset the ecology of the bay with more modern methods. 
The Bay to them is their life and livelihood, and they want to protect it at all costs. They're very concerned about any talk of developing the area. They're especially jealous about preserving the ecology on St. George Island. In a curious way, they're guaranteed that the island will never be run over by tourists or overwhelmed with condominiums. If there's to be any spectacular development, in their view, it's to be right here in the bay, in these waters. These fishermen believe that if properly cared for, the bay can produce untold wealth for them and help to feed a hungry world. This is one of my favorite areas here. It was inhabited at one time by the Indians and this was one of their favorite fishing places. And uh, at the head of this uh, basin or bay, uh, there's an Indian midden where you'll find Indian pottery and a lot of cedar trees, large magnolia trees, hickory trees and so forth. The, the type of vegetation that you find around uh, uh, Indian mounds and Indian middens and it's easy to see why that they would use this type of area to camp in uh, because there's such an abundance of fish and uh, wildlife and uh, oysters in this area and probably there were clams here too at that time and it's still a favorite fishing place of your commercial fishermen and your uh, sports fishermen alike they all come in here to do their fishing and their floundering and, and picnicking this sort of thing of course, we have a road just to the south of us here that takes people down to the jetties where it's very good fishing and hunting down there. And uh, as you can see, there's uh, a lot of uh, hammocks and thickets and uh, piney woods, all types of terrain in this area. So hand me that map. Let me see something. I'll show you the, the general layout. This island has a, a very interesting shape to it. It's actually kind of like a golf club shape. And uh, the section that we're on here is about uh, 22 miles long, and we're about in this position here at Nick's Hole. And as you can see, the island on the base side uh, has a heavy vegetation of all types, and over on the Gulf side, you have rolling sand dunes and sea oats, and uh, it's a very interesting island, and of course, back years ago, you. Uh, hear tales of treasure ships and uh, wrecking on the island and buried treasure and all this sort of thing, which we'd all like to find some of that, wouldn't we? I remember back uh, before the bridge was built, we used to cross on a ferry boat. Put up your safety chain and cast off. Let's go. mid-1950s and numbered no more than a dozen. A ferry identical to this one was their lifeline to the mainland. It took three quarters of an hour to get across the bay and cost just the same as the bridge does today. about two or three miles off the coast here. Yeah. Look at that thing. What is it? Huh? That is a quick sinking valve. Came off a rum runner boat that we found out there, the wreckage of it. 
Must have been out there a good 40 years or so. This is what they used to flood the boat in a hurry before the Coast Guard could catch them with the evidence. And these things are rare, because they're all specially made just for that purpose. We saw some beautiful patch coral, some patch reefs, you know, they have coral formations, and then wide sand expanses and some more coral. And all around in these coral formations are the most beautiful fish that you've ever seen. There's angelfish, and there's grouper, and they're very colorful fish. We dived for about 40 minutes, and we went down to about 30 feet. And, uh, saw some magnificent sights. Where are we going tomorrow? I think we'll go back out to the Empire Mica tomorrow. Uh, she was a British tanker that uh, Mike and I were on yesterday. She was sank in about August of 42 by a German submarine. She's in 105 feet of water. She's about 18 miles southwest of St. George's Island. The water out there is gorgeous. The most impressive thing is how clear the water is and the way the sunlight filters down through the water. It's beautiful. St. George Island is about 27 miles long. A white sandy beach runs its entire length on the ocean side. In width, the island ranges from several hundred yards to over a mile. The island has a fantastic variety of wildlife and vegetation. Perhaps 50 permanent residents live on St. George Island with a trickle of visitors. Each has an enjoyable reason for being here. A fragile balance exists in Apalachicola Bay. The fresh river water that pours into the bay protects the shellfish there from saltwater predators and life abounds in the blueness between St. George and Apalachicola. The people who take their livelihood from the bay protect this fragile balance at any cost. They're a sure guarantee that the island won't be ruined by condominiums and tourists. Only a few miles from a wildlife refuge, much of St. George Island itself is a natural preserve owned by the state. Another insurance that St. George won't be damaged by commercialization. A lot 
of the island is controlled by leisure properties, a group of people who want to make part of St. George Island available to people who care about living in a beautiful, unspoiled environment. Single-family homes will be built, each surrounded by a full acre of untouched shoreline and woodlands. At a time when living space close to nature is at a premium, Leisure Properties provides a rare opportunity to make a home where simple, natural beauty is in abundance. On St. George Island. But I think if you come here as I have and see the mood of the people, you'll be pretty optimistic. Chances are anyone living here, even years from now, will still be able to wade out into the bay before dinner, come back with a bucket full of the choicest oysters in the world for the evening meal. That's what life is all about on St. George Island.